Hey everyone, Gil Gross here. Post match, Carlos Alcaraz versus Grigor Dimitrov, Miami Open 2024 quarterfinal. If you're not here for spoilers, click off the video. Dimitrov beats Alcaraz for a second straight meeting. This one is 6 2, 6 4. He advances to the semis. He'll face Verev. I'll talk about the semifinals quickly at the end of this video. Not going to do a full preview, but I'll offer my thoughts on it. As for this match, where Grigor Dimitrov had a point for 5-1 in the second, so it was almost blowout city, late comeback from Alcaraz, break of serve at 4-5 by Dimitrov to win the match. But from start to finish, it might have been the best I've ever seen Grigor Dimitrov play. It is, without a shadow of the doubt, definitively, the best I've ever seen him return serve. It was so good where in the first couple return games, I thought, oh my God, his return, it's its incredible. There's no way he can keep this up the whole match. He pretty much kept it up the whole match. The consistent depth on the first serve return was staggering from Dimitrov. You can, you can look at it statistically. I mean, Alcaraz won. It was 56%, 55.9 to be exact, of his first serve points. So let's say 56%. So first of all, I have two stats for you. First of all, Alcaraz has never won a match in his career with a first serve win percentage that low. The lowest he's been is 57.4%. He won a match against Vucevic in 2021. So he's never won a match with that low a first serve win percentage. How often has that happened? Well, since, first of all, in 2021, it happened quite a bit. He had basically no serve in 2021. But let's go from the start of 2022, when Alcaraz really became a top player. He's only been worse twice. It's a match against uh, David Goffin in Astana. And the match at Roland Garros, uh, the semifinal against Djokovic, where, who knows, you know, the, the last two sets, 6-1, 6-1, where he was cramping. Should we even count that? Because we know he was barely playing the last two sets, and that's going to really make the stats go down. So, statistically, it really follows the eye test of what I was seeing and what I think everyone was probably seeing with Dimitrov's return of Alcaraz's serve, where... He was dictating so often on Alcaraz's first serve return points, meaning the the return would be so deep and so stifling that Dimitrov would get an aggressive forehand into play on the fourth shot of the rally off of his return. And that's the first serve return. But another thing that was evident in this match that highlights what a stratospheric level that Dimitrov was able to reach was the consistency at which he was hitting his one-handed backhand when he was driving it with perfect timing right in the middle of the strings, clean as can be. And sure, that's important in rally. Yeah, but I think where that was most important was on, once again, the return, but this time, the second serve return. On the first serve return, oftentimes, he's going to chip the backhand. And he was just chipping it with fantastic depth and a lot of speed and really good stick. Um, but on the second serve return, Alcaraz is going to hit a kick serve to Dimitrov's backhand. That's going to be Alcaraz's second serve. He made an adjustment eventually, and if he didn't, it would have probably or potentially been a 6-2, 6-1 win for Dimitrov. I'll talk about that later. But until Alcaraz made that adjustment... Dimitrov was standing way inside the baseline and taking that Alcaraz kick serve early on the rise and just hammering it, absolutely ripping it off the one-handed backhand and never missing. I just don't think he was really missing uh, when he was being aggressive on that second return. So I, I, you know, would critique Alcaraz's predictability there. You know, he he should have recognized it and mixed it up sooner. But also, it's in, it's in the scouting report. You know, Dimitrov is not always really all that good 
at hitting aggressive second serve returns with the one-handed backhand. It's not a strength, particularly when you ask him to hit down the line on the ad side or inside out on the deuce side, both of which he did extraordinarily well. And I will add at this time as well that in the 4-5 game when Dimitrov broke serve at the, the love all point, the first point of that Alcaraz service game, he decided to go back to the Dimitrov backhand. He had been going to the forehand on the on big points in the last like 10 or so minutes or the previous 10 or so minutes. And he thought, okay, I've I've mixed it up. I've gone to the forehand. Let's go to the backhand again. Bang! Winner. Dimitrov hit a winner. Love 15. And while we're on the topic of Dimitrov's backhand, well, let's just say that on the, the next point, Dimitrov hit a scorching backhand down the line that forced an error. And on the point after that, Alcaraz tried to approach the Dimitrov backhand, and Grigor hit this fantastic, low, dipping, biting slice pass. Um, so that made it... Did that make it love 40 or that made it 1540? Might, might have been love 40. Uh, then another really good second serve return rushed Alcaraz's forehand on the match point. Bang. All she wrote, that was the match. So... You know, when, when you talk about how good Dimitrov's backhand was in this match, look no further than that 4-5 game. So let's take a moment also to think about who Dimitrov is as a player, how he's constructed, and how you might be able to get relief when you're playing Grigor Dimitrov. Well, his movement has always been elite. The serve and the forehand has been, to me, the main reason why he's been so difficult to be and so consistent over the last seven or eight months where he's probably been, and I, I know it's arguable because the rankings haven't always really played out this way, but I think he's been a top eight player over the last, you know, seven, eight months or so. He's knocking on the door of the top 10 in, in the rankings now if he beats Verev, he'll enter the top 10. Uh, so movement. Serve, forehand. Where do you get relief against Dimitrov? Usually it's his return and it's his backhand. Those are the parts of his game that can be vulnerable. So when the return is going to be stupendously good and the backhand is going to be exceptionally good. What do you do? What do you do? So all this is to say, I just thought Dimitrov put in a spectacular performance. And of all the times we've seen Alcaraz lose matches in the last, uh, you know, I'll just say since Wimbledon, uh, this has to be up there with just the least concerning of the bunch. Alcaraz came in in a really good place mentally, very, very confident. Now, I do have critiques, and I will get to those critiques. Um, but all in all, I don't know if it was really all that possible to beat Dimitrov on this day. Maybe if a couple of the big points went differently early, it could have changed the tenor of the match. Uh, maybe if, if Alcaraz found a way to make first serves in that 4-5 game because he, he only made one of five. I, I highlighted how good Dimitrov's backhand was, but... Alcaraz's first serve also massively failed him in that game. Uh, yeah, well, maybe at, at some point or another, Dimitrov could have dipped. I, I do think physically there was a point in the match where Grigor did fatigue. That is, you know, when Alcaraz got the break of serve back in the second set, I felt his, his legs weren't really there um, after a long and physical return game where he almost went up 5-1. Yeah. Um, and then in the in the next service game, the the serve and the forehand, the, it just looked tired to me. And Alcaraz just really jumped on Dimitrov from there, made some aggressive returns, hit some massive, massive forehands, and ended up breaking serve, getting back level. Um, but again, all in all, 10 out of 10 performance from Dimitrov. And in that respect, I'm not all that critical of Alcaraz. Um... 
Okay, a couple of different ways I could go from there, uh, but let's let's talk about the one thing that I I would critique Alcaraz for. Mentally, I think that there was some panic and some desperation that set in unnecessarily so. The first five games of this match were of a really, really rich quality. Very high quality. And Alcaraz had break points in Dimitrov's first two service games. And on both occasions, Dimitrov was able to hold serve. All that to say that the first five games of the match could have gone many ways. And I think for Alcaraz, all he needed to do at that point was stay the course. It was, you know, one thing that, man, I must have read Rafa Nadal's book that that he wrote. It was a long time ago, and I read it a long time ago. It's maybe been like 15 years since I read Nadal's book. But one of the things that stuck with me at the time as a as a young student of the game, I've never forgotten it, is just how much he talked about when he was playing Roger Federer and Federer was playing his best, sometimes it was just a waiting game. I'm changing nothing. I am not panicking. I'm just waiting until the level dips. That is such a virtue in tennis. I don't think Alcaraz has an ounce of that in his body. Because he played great. He played great and, and he was down 4-1. But he didn't recognize that he didn't need to change anything. Instead, you could see he started to take bigger risks to try to stay in attack. Not It wasn't always with, to his credit, it wasn't always harder, harder, harder. Uh, you know, some of it was playing closer to the sidelines, hitting drop shots, serving volleying, sometimes upping the pace, sometimes shrinking the targets. But you could see that the percentage tennis was starting to shift after that first few games. You could see a change in return position. And the deep return position that Alcaraz started the match with was actually working pretty well. He was generating consistent break points, but he changed it and he started to stand in. You could see him constantly going to Ferrero, constantly at this point. Not something that I'm usually critical of, not something that I think takes away from Alcaraz as a player, but I think it did, in this case, demonstrate a certain desperation that, that set in uh, tactically for Alcaraz because he felt like he needed answers. What am I going to do? What am I going to change? To me, the answer was nothing. You're playing great. Just stay the course. The other thing you could see was all the joy leave his face. It seemed like he kind of recaptured some of that levity the last couple weeks. He said many times that when he's playing well, he is smiling, that he's not all that stressed out. He got very stressed very quickly. And I just think in time, he'll learn how to just stay calm when losing. You know, he hates being a passenger he obviously hates losing. Everybody does. Uh, but at, at some point or another, I think he'll figure out a way to just be a little bit more calm when it happens and to not kind of allow for himself to start to be more erratic as he was end of the second set or sorry, end of the first set, start of the second set, where I just thought there was a lot of panic in his game. He did eventually make the second serve adjustment, probably too late. It, it cost him before he ended up making the adjustment, but I will give credit Alcaraz to Alcaraz for starting to serve. You have two options. So I mentioned that Dimitrov was absolutely pummeling the kick serve to the backhand. There are two things you can do. First of all, Grigor, in order to pummel the backhand return, was having to take the ball before it got above the shoulders. In order for him to do that, he had to stand really, really close. So what can Alcaraz do? Serve the body. Hit the second serve into the body. The other option is to try to rush the forehand return of Dimitrov. That's what he, that's what he ended up doing for the most part. Um, and it was very, very effective. He saved break point to go down 5-1. 
And it was, I think, the first second serve he hit to Dimitrov's forehand all match long. Good adjustment there. Um, the other thing that I'll mention, this is not a criticism. It's um, a lot of it is just a compliment to Dimitrov. It's just a reality of these conditions. And it's the last thing I'll say about the match. You know, at Indian Wells, he was hitting a loopier ball with uh, more net clearance and heavier topspin. And then at some point or another, certainly injecting pace or it, it, some of these examples, there's still a ton of pace. It's just there's pace and spin. It's just an extraordinarily heavy ball that Alcaraz is able to hit. Well, I felt that at times when Alcaraz tried to impart heavier topspin on the ball and it landed short at Indian Wells, whether it be against Sinner or against Medvedev, there was so much jump off the court surface that it wasn't hurting Alcaraz. In this match, Dimitrov was hurting him. He was hitting great high forehands. He was hitting great on the rise forehands, taking time away. And he was taking advantage of the surface. Two things are going to happen. One, it's going to be a lower bounce incoming. That's going to make the Alcaraz topspin simply less problematic when it comes to uh, jumping out of the hitting zone. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when Dimitrov hits his aggressive forehand from shoulder height and he flattens out that ball, which he does very well, it's going to be a quicker bounce on that outgoing ball by Dimitrov. And where, where Alcaraz was gaining a lot of defensive advantages from hitting the loopier ball giving him more time to get in position and forcing his opponents to generate more pace from the middle of the court. Exceptionally effective against Sinner um, at Indian Wells, particularly in the third set when Yannick just started missing it. Uh, Dimitrov was not missing it, and Alcaraz was not able to really neutralize and defend as well as he was able to do at Indian Wells. Goes back to the court speed. So in general, the... The depth, when Alcaraz was not finding depth, it was not going unpunished. Credit to Dimitrov for that, but also note the, the lower bouncing and faster court surface. All right, let's talk about these semis a little bit. Um, I am going to try to keep this tight. Dimitrov hasn't beaten Zverev in a, in a, sorry, other way around. No, no, I said it right. Dimitrov hasn't beaten Zverev in a long, long time. He beat Zverev, I think it was 2016. Sasha uh, had legs that were, were this this thick. Now they've grown to being like this much, but they were like that. So uh, it's been a very long time. I think Sasha does a couple things. And I'll, I, I do want to try to create a contrast from what Alcaraz does. Zverev will keep it boring. He, he loves boring. He will not have to he will not try to be creative. He will not get out of position. He will not necessarily look to uh, break out of neutral rallies. He's just going to pound the Dimitrov backhand with terrific depth, terrific consistency, terrific patience, pretty good pace, and he'll just wait. He will and and he will feel that he has the um the physical, it, not only a consistency advantage, not only is he just more solid um, if, if he's able to just play Dimitrov's neutral backhand, but also I think physically Zverev usually has an advantage here. He, he Grigor is athletic and explosive, but he is not a titan of endurance. And I think we've seen that at this tournament. I'm uh, really hot right now, so I'm going to take off this jacket mid-analysis. This shirt is a little embarrassing, though. Um, anyway, so that's what Zverev does, I think, in neutral rallies. But also, he he's able to attack Dimitrov's, I'll call it, return weakness. It's one of those things. I don't think Dimitrov has a terrible return, but it's just a little bit average. And when you're talking about facing elite players, average is bad. You know what I mean? So 
with with Zverev's serve pace, that's been effective against Dimitrov. In the last seven meetings, which is seven wins in a row for Zverev, uh, Dimitrov has never broken Sasha more than twice. What Dimitrov tried to do at the U.S. Open to try to counter the whole backhand thing was just slice a ton. Slice, 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 makes Zverev lift up on the backhand and then be really aggressive on the next forehand. That's what he tried to do. What Zverev did in part was, uh, first of all, it kind of worked. Kind of worked. Dimitrov had a chance to go up two sets to love. Both of the first two sets were very, very close at the U.S. Open. I was at that match. Ultimately, it was unbelievably physical because Dimitrov, or sorry, Zverev, it's not really a way to be off. How do I, how do I put this? Zverev is content to just try to hit a good backhand trade and hang in, you know, just, he's not going to miss off of Dimitrov's slice. And he, he might do a pretty good job of remaining unattackable off of Dimitrov's backhand slice cross court. So it's a good tactic for Grigor. I'm curious to see how much does he drive? How much does he slice? Slicing is usually a better call for him, but it's not an easy way to win. It it still is very hard physically. It requires him to work the point quite a bit. All right, ultimately, I actually, look, I, I know as well as Dimitrov played here, it was unbelievable, but as we've seen, you know, every match is different. Grigor almost lost to Al, my dark horse, Alejandro Tabilo, in, in his first match here. It was very close um, lost the first set. Second set was a tight tie break. Almost lost to Hercotch in the, the the round of 16. That went to a third set tie break. Grigor was exhausted. Was kind of lucky to win that two all point when Hercotch's foot touched the net. And then here against Alcaraz, he played maybe the best match ever. So you just don't have. This is how tennis is. Every match is different. And I, I don't think Dimitrov will, will replicate the level. I think Zverev will win easier points with his serve. And I think the, he'll find the backhand way more often than Alcaraz did because he's more diligent about being boring and monotonous in that way. And uh, he'll untap possibly a physical edge because Grigor's endurance has looked at times a little shaky here in Miami. So I pick uh, Zverev. I'll say in, um, I'll say in straights, actually. Uh, Medvedev versus Sinner. Daniil will have a full gas tank this time, but I still think we'll see shades of the Australian Open tactics that Medvedev deployed against Sinner, uh, which is closer return position, more aggression from the baseline, try to rush Yannick a little bit, hit ground strokes hard, play down the line quite a bit. I think Daniil understands that his typical way of playing is uh, is not quite good enough against the Yannick Sinner, that he just needs to do a little bit extra, that making every ball deep into the court, changing direction often, but just doing the, I'm more consistent, I'm very difficult to attack, I'm incredibly hard to hit through, and under that pressure, you're just going to fold. That's the game plan. That's the default game plan. Sinner, it's a different animal because he's arguably just as physical now. He has more baseline power to hit through, but he also has the auxiliary tools to mix in the drop shot and to come forward and to play sharper angles. All of the fantastic skill set that is actually good enough to find a way to beat Medvedev, even in the most defensive of postures. So Daniil needs to attack more and he needs to shut down the serve and volley and the serve plus one drop shot. And I think he'll do those things. The concern is that Sinner has beat him in the last, what, four meetings in such a vast variety of ways. Uh, it was in Beijing where Sinner used heavy variety. I'm going to oversimplify uh, for the sake of time. It was in Vienna where he was out solid, and he, he was more solid and more physical than Medvedev. And Daniil's legs actually uh, 
reached the the empty point before Sinner's legs did. At the ATP Finals, well, Daniil did try to be more aggressive, and he actually made quite a few errors at the year-end championships when they played. Then at the Australian Open, it was really, uh, you can't summarize the match in one sentence because there were different phases of the match. You know, we know that Medvedev blitzed Sinner with offense in the first two sets. In the third set, there was still residue of of Medvedev playing a, a, a fantastic level and kind of taking Sinner by surprise and shell-shocking Sinner in a way. But Yannick in the third set vastly outserved Medvedev. And it was really the, the serve battle that kind of flipped that, to me, bought Sinner enough time to finally get comfortable in the match, win the third set, and then the last two sets, uh, that's when Daniil's fatigue really set in. He And Sinner uh, didn't let Medvedev use his serve as a weapon from there, you know, made tons of returns, and was the stronger player from the baseline in every way, sets four and five. So the argument for Medvedev is this. We haven't seen him put all the pieces together against Sinner. The close return position, the aggressive baselining, a full gas tank, and getting more first serve help. Which, by the way, I, I, the reason why I didn't... My logic for not picking Medvedev to defend his title here, other than how good Sinner is in Miami and how well he's been playing, is that I just felt like Daniil needed to serve better. Last couple matches have looked a little bit better. So, uh, getting first serve help you know, w would also be a part of the equation, a must for Medvedev if he wants to win this match. But I, I still, I'm going to go back on the feeling that Sinner just has more options, more ways to win, more paths to victory, the ability to beat Medvedev's defense, the ability to hang in physically if they play a lot from the baseline, uh, the ability to win the game of errors if Medvedev is going to try to uh, really take the, the role of aggressor in the match. And that is why I will say Sinner in three. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.